Many of our people do not realize how firmly the foundation of our faith has been laid. Light was given that helped us to understand the scriptures in regard to Christ, His mission, and His priesthood. A line of truth extending from 1844 to the time when we shall enter the city of God was made plain. Okay, good morning, everybody. Yes, good afternoon. It's afternoon right now, so it is technically afternoon, right? Uh, have you guys been blessed so far? Amen. Okay, you're right. True, true. Well, it's been a blessing to be here with you guys. Let's get started with a, uh, a word of prayer. So let's bow our heads. Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together. And as we open your word again, we just uh, pray that the very spirit uh, of your dear son may be amongst us, that Jesus may be abiding here in this place and that our comforter will teach us and lead us and guide us into truth. And Father, I pray that our hearts will be just receptive to hearing from you and that our hearts will be converted and prepared for the soon coming of your dear son, which is, uh, which is about to happen in our world. And so I pray that we can be ready. Open our ears, open our hearts to see wonderful things out of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, the message that I have this afternoon or morning, if you're going by biblical time, is called The Goodness of God. The Goodness of God. Now, I want to make a disclaimer. Okay, is everybody listening up? Got to make a, a disclaimer here. This sermon is not what you, what you think. Okay, because when I give you the title, The Goodness of God, what's the first thing you're probably thinking of? The Goodness of God Leads Us to Repentance. And you'd be wrong because that's not what the sermon's about. It's true, though. It's not about, it is true. That is a true statement. But that's not what the, uh, the sermon or the message this morning is about. It's primarily about something else. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, I'm going to do something I probably shouldn't tell you. I'm going to give you the main point of the message right here, right now up front. So if you fall asleep or get bored, at least you'll get something out of this. <laughs> If you listen up right now, okay? So do I have your attention yet? Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. So just listen to this, and then if you need to, you can go to sleep. Or take a break or something, whatever you need to do. So here it is. You ready? Paying attention? All right. Here's the main point of the message. The six, what did I say? Six. six. The six is not... The one. The six is not the one. And now you're probably thinking, oh, six. Six is not the one. Six, six days shalt thou labor, and this, the six is not the one. Well, you'd be wrong again. The six is not the one. So it's not that either. Okay, everybody got that? All right. Did you get it? All right, so now you can, well, I guess you can't fall asleep because you don't have a, you don't, <laughs> now you have to pay attention. Now you want to know what the six is, right? Don't you want to know what the six is? Don't you want to know what the one is? Because the six is not the one. But the six illustrates the one. And that's the point of this message, that the six actually reveals the one. The one. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. And I'm sure your heads are probably spinning. You're probably thinking, what is this guy talking about? Where is he going with this? 
And there's probably all sorts of thoughts and it's probably way off from what you're thinking. So Matthew chapter 19, yes. We're actually going to be talking about the rich young ruler this morning, the rich young ruler. So let's look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. And we're going to break it down very slowly and uh, just try to draw as much as we can from the story of the rich young ruler. Now, the rich young ruler, this story uh, takes place or is recorded three places in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 19, Mark chapter 10, and Luke chapter 18. So Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke chapter 18. So let's start. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. It says, Behold, what? Behold, one came. Well, the question is, who is the one that came, and how did he come? Now, when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we find out who it is that came and how he came. So turn with me to Luke chapter 18. So first of all, we want to understand who is it who, that came to Jesus. And then we're going to look at how he came. Luke 18, 18. It says, a certain what? Ruler. Okay, so who was it that came? The ruler. And I kind of gave that away when I said a rich young ruler. But here in Luke, it says that a ruler, a certain ruler asked him. And Matthew, it said, one came. Here it just says a certain ruler. Now turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Because how did he come? So here you have a ruler that came. How did he come? Mark chapter 10, verse 17. When he was gone forth into the way, there came one, what? Running. Came running to Jesus. So when we compare these three verses, we see that there, there was one, a ruler that came running. Why did he come running? Why was he running to Jesus? I mean, I figure if somebody's running to Jesus or running to somebody else, it must have, he must have had something on his heart and on his mind, right? If I'm running to somebody else, there's got to be a reason why you're running. He had a reason why he was running. And not only did he run to Jesus, what did he do when he got to Jesus? It says that he, he kneeled. So there came one running, a ruler. Now, how often do you see a ruler that rules over people running to somebody else? That's pretty significant. And kneeling. And who was he kneeling before? A simple, yeah. humble Galilean, right? Nazarene. A carpenter. He came running to him, a ruler, and kneeled. There was a reason why. He had something on his heart. So he was a man of authority. There was something on his heart. Something was driving him. Something was drawing him to the Savior. What was it? Turn back to Mark, not Mark, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16. So here we have a running ruler comes running to Jesus and kneels down. And what does he say? Matthew 19, 16, behold, one came and said unto him, good Master, good master. So he comes, and I don't know if this is because, like, he says good master in order to flatter Jesus. He must have thought that Jesus was good. And I wonder, like, why did he think that Jesus was good? Why did he say good master? Well, that same question Jesus asked. Look at verse 17. Jesus says unto him, why callest thou me good? So the rich young ruler comes running to Jesus, kneels down, and he says, good master. And Jesus' response says, why are you calling me good? Why are you calling me good? 
Now, why did he call Jesus good? And if we understand why the, the, the mindset of this rich young ruler, I think we get an insight into why he called Jesus good. Now, follow along with me. Matthew chapter 19, verse 1. Let's look at verse 1. Why did he call Jesus good? Did you know that news travels fast? Did you know that? And it seems like good news travels fast, but bad news travels faster. Doesn't it seem like it that nowadays? Well, you know, my wife and I, we, uh, we've been looking for property. And I took a trip out to Arkansas, and uh, I found a place. And it looks like we may be moving to Arkansas. And I haven't, really, like, I haven't really told that many people that we're moving. I told like a couple people. I think maybe she's told a couple people. And then it's like news travels and we get people asking us, oh, I heard you're moving to Arkansas. Like, wait, did I tell you that? Like, and so now this is going over the internet. So now I'm going to get even more people asking me, hey, I heard you're going to Arkansas. But it just illustrates like news travels, right? News travels. I think there was some news information that had traveled to this man. And perhaps this is the reason why he came running. Perhaps this is the reason why he came and he said, good master. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 1. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these saints, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. Verse 2. And great multitudes followed him. And he did what? He healed them there. He healed them there. Now, in other places in the gospel, there was whole villages and great multitudes of people that came to Jesus, and it says that he healed them all. Now, if everyone... Now, just imagine in that time, everyone that came to Jesus walked away healed? Could you imagine how that would spread? I mean, that would go, in today's vernacular, viral, right? It was viral. It went viral. Everybody was talking about this new, young, hip rabbi, right? I don't know about hip, but this new rabbi that was healing everybody. And I imagine that news traveled, or what Jesus was doing, his works, traveled to the people. And it traveled to this rich, young ruler. So he comes to him. Now turn with me to verse 13 and 14 as well. Matthew 19, 13 and 14. It says, Then were there brought unto him little children, that they should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. Before we read the next one, I believe, I, I'm not sure if the rich young ruler, if he saw Jesus hurt people, but I'm pretty sure that he saw, there's evidence, at least in the spirit of prophecy, that he saw Jesus' interaction with the children. Now, why would that be significant? Well, let's talk about it after we read this verse, verse 14. But Jesus said, Suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. So here is a ruler. And now what is a ruler? A ruler is somebody that has other people under them. Now, as a ruler, as a leader, at least in secular society, you can get away to a certain degree, greater or lesser degree, if you're a politician, then, you know, it's, it's greater. But you can get away with treating those under you pretty bad. Isn't that how it works usually? Like if you have authority, you exercise that authority over people, over people that are under you. And you can even get away with being sometimes rude, treating them badly. Isn't that kind of common? I mean... Most of us have, that have jobs, we have like managers. You've probably, had like, you've probably had a job where you have like a really bad manager. 
that just is nasty and rude. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. It's because they have authority. Now, here is a ruler that has authority, understands what it means to like interact with people. And he sees Jesus and his disciples say, you know, forbid the children. They, they're, they're trying to block the children from coming to Jesus. And Jesus says, no, let them come. Let them come. There must have been something in that interaction that touched the heart. Because here is Jesus. He's in a place of authority because people look to him. And children are the lowest members of society. Right? Not as significant as somebody that is a ruler. And Jesus treats these little children with respect and dignity. Isn't that right? Amen for Jesus' example. I mean, children are a blessing from the Lord. And children are important. I praise God for those that are here that are organizing meetings to teach our children. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Bless. May God bless you for doing that. Because it's just as important. And their spiritual life is just as important as adults. And Jesus, he taught, he, 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 he was tender toward the children. And I imagine this rich young ruler, he saw that and there was something in his heart that he noticed Jesus was different in his authority over people. And so he comes to him and he says, what? Good master. Good master. He saw or he heard the miracles of healing. Uh, he saw the love that Jesus had towards the children and he called them good based upon what he probably saw or heard or saw. Now keep that in your mind. Look at verse 16, because this is going to be connected to it. Behold, one came, this running ruler said to him, good master, what good thing must I do that I may inherit eternal life. So you start to see kind of the mentality here. He sees Jesus doing all these wonderful works. He sees him teaching and, and, and like allowing the children to come to him. He was tender towards the children. He comes to Jesus and he says, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what does Jesus say? This is, this is significant because Jesus is the master worker. He knows how to read hearts and minds. And he says something. He read the heart and mind of this, this ruler. And he says something based upon the mindset and the attitude of this rich young ruler. So the rich young ruler comes and he says, what must I do? Jesus says, why are you calling me? Good. Why are you calling me good? Isn't, isn't that kind of a strange statement? I mean, isn't Jesus good? Then why does he say, well, why are you calling me good? And then he says, there is how many good? None good, but one. That is God. So who's he talking about? The Father. He says, there's none good but one. That's the Father. Can you imagine that response? It seems kind of off. He, he, the rich young ruler comes to him. What must I do? There's none good. Why are you calling me good? There's none good but God. There was something that the rich young ruler needed to understand and know. And this is what I believe it is. That God, the Father, is the source of all goodness. And I believe this is why Jesus, not that he was like denying that inherently Jesus is good, but because he did not understand the source of every single good thing, which is the Father. You see, I, I imagine and I think in the way that I read this is he came to Jesus and he said, what must I do? 
He said, good master. I think, at least the way that I read this, is that in his mind, he was attributing good works to the individual, to the person. And Jesus had to redirect him to the source of all goodness. Are you with me so far? All right. So this is what Jesus had to do. Because he was thinking that, you know, he was the source of the good works himself. All right. Now, just for clarification, how did Jesus live his life? Because he says, there's none that's good but one. Now, I just want to point out in John chapter 5, a couple verses. John chapter 5 and verse 30. Jesus himself had said, I can of mine own self do how much? So Jesus himself, did he rely on the Father? All the good works that Jesus did. Who did him? It was the Father. The Father did all the good works in Jesus. Now, if you don't believe me on that one, we'll go to another verse. John chapter 14 and verse 10. He says it very clearly. John 14, verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? So by the way, this is the chapter that speaks of the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Now, was the Holy Spirit in Jesus? Yes. But did Jesus call the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit? He said, it's my father. It's my father that's in me. So from Jesus' perspective, his own perspective, his own experience, who was comforting him? Who was empowering him? Who was working through him? He says right there, over and over again, he says, my father. And here in verse 10, it says, the words that I speak... I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Okay, so Jesus has this rich young ruler come to him and say, good master, what must I do? And he says, there's none good but one. That's God. He had to point him to the source that even himself, Jesus himself was relying on on the goodness of God, on the power and the works of God to be accomplished in him. All right, let's continue on in our story back to Matthew chapter 19. What must I do to inherit, uh, in, uh, actually, if, if you look in Mark and Luke, it says, what must I do to inherit uh, eternal life? And here in Matthew, it says, what must I do to have eternal life. Well, Jesus answers that. Verse 17, why callest thou me good? There's none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, do what? Keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. So Jesus says, if you want to enter into life, do what? Keep the commandments. Guard. All right. Is that what it says, guard? Well, no, it says keep, but the version is uh, Yeah, guarded. Which I'm assuming guarded in your heart, probably first and foremost. But do. We need to do the commandments. If we're going to enter into life. And I believe that's true. I believe that's true, that we need to do and keep the God's commandments. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Now, the problem is, because there's many people today that say, well, we don't need to do or keep the commandments. But the issue that I have is, and that's kind of up for debate, how? How? How do we realistically keep the commandments? And do we know, do we understand what that means? Do we understand the depth and the breadth 
of what it means to keep the commandments or is our view shallow and superficial? Because I think if we understood what, it, what Jesus was actually saying, we would be saying, how is that possible? How? How? Lord? How? But he says, nevertheless, he does say very clearly, if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. Now, what was the rich young ruler's response? What did he, what did he say? Verse 18. Before that, he says, which he saith unto him, which? Which one? Keep the commandments. Which one? Which one? What does Jesus say? Continuing on. Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now reading this one right here. Um, here we have, we're talking about the Ten Commandments. You have the last six. I thought that Jesus was only listing five and then the principle, but really you have the sixth commandment, then the seventh, then the eighth, then the ninth, and then the fifth. And then he ends with thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, which really is the 10th commandment. It really summarizes the 10th commandment, which says thou shalt not covet, you know, thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's wife or anything that is thy neighbor's. Love thy neighbor as thyself. If you're coveting something that your neighbor has, you think and you want that which your neighbor has, you're putting yourself above your neighbor. But if you don't covet, you're happy for your neighbor and you're happy with what you have. Love thy neighbor as thyself. So I see that as being the fulfillment of the ten. 10th commandment. So here he lists off the last six commandments. Now, what is the ruler's response? I think I heard Wayne say it. Verse 20. The young man said unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. All these things I've done. I've done them. I've been doing them. Hattie, yeah. I want to read a statement from Christ's Object Lessons, page 391. The young man answered without hesitation. He was pretty confident of himself, wasn't he? The young man answered without hesitation. All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? His conception of the law was external and superficial. Judged by a human standard, he had preserved an unblemished character. To a great degree, his outward life had been free from guilt. He verily thought that his obedience had been without a flaw. Wow. He verily thought that his obedience had been without a now, what does the word verily mean? Truly, right? He truly, was he sincere yes. when he said that? He was sincere. Did he believe it? Yes. He believed it, but was he correct? No. Now, what do we call, what do we call when someone truly believes something, they truly believe it, but they're wrong? Deceived. Deceived. What do we call when a person truly believes something about themselves, but they are wrong? They are self-deceived. They don't even know their own heart. They are self-deceived. Was this rich young ruler, was he self-deceived? He believed. He barely thought his obedience was perfect. He believed it. He thought it. Whew, man. He had a higher 
estimation of himself than that which was true. Makes me think about what we read yesterday. The Pharisee versus the publican. You know Christ? <sighs> Jesus is so good, you know? Ah, he's so good. You know, you just read and study about the character of Christ. I don't know about you, but did you... <sighs> I listen to Desire of Ages, I, I read and I study about the character of Christ, and I just see his goodness. Like he's so good. And then it's like, man, I'm so wicked. <laughs> Did you know that Jesus knew, he read this man's heart. Yes. He knew his life. He knew that this person was self-deceived. Did Jesus... Take him and shake him and like, wake up, man. You're, you're deceived about yourself. Turn with me to Mark. Chapter 10, verse 20 and 21. He answered and said unto him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Verse 21, then Jesus, behold him, loved him. Jesus looked at him in his self-deceived condition. And he loved him. Did you know that there's people, probably people in here, maybe some of you. I pray none of you, I pray that not myself. But there are people today that are self-deceived. And it's easy for some of us to recognize it in others. It's harder to recognize it in ourselves. But you know, when we come across somebody that we know is deceived, even self-deceived, how did Jesus respond? How was Jesus' attitude? Love. He loved. He loved him. He loved him. Jesus saw him with all of his faults, his character flaws, and he loved him. Praise God. You know, because that's how Jesus views every one of us. With our faults. With our shortcomings. With all of our problems. Now, in order to reveal the self-deception to the rich young ruler, because Christ needed to do something for him. This rich young ruler needed to see something. What was it that he needed to see? His true condition. His need and his true condition. Turn with me to Mark chapter 10. So Jesus puts him to the test. He says, all these things I've kept from my youth up. I've kept them all. Jesus loves him. And I can imagine he says, okay, really, all right. And he puts him to a test. Mark chapter 10, verse 21. <clears throat> then Jesus beholding him loved him and said unto him one thing thou lack because the rich young he said he said I've done all these is there anything that I lack what lack I yet and he says one thing you lack go thy way sell whatever you have give to the poor thou shalt have treasure in heaven come Take up the cross and follow me. How many things did Jesus tell him to go do? Go, sell, give, come, take up, and follow. Six things. My question is, was it the six things that Jesus told him to do that he lacked? Because he says, he says, you lack one thing, yeah. and then he tells him to go do six things. Yeah. Those were the right, we recognize the one thing that was still lacking. He told him six things. 
in order to reveal his condition that he lacked one thing. Are you with me? The six was not the one. But the six illustrated the one thing that he lacked. In other words, God, or God through Christ, Jesus told him to go do six things. And it wasn't the doing. It wasn't the doing that he lacked. There was something deeper and greater that he lacked. It's the one thing. Christ Object Lesson, page 392. He professed to have kept the commandments, but he was destitute of the principle, which is the very spirit and life of them all. He did not possess true love for God and men. So he, he thought his obedience was perfect. He thought he was keeping all the commandments. Yet he lacked the very spirit and life of them all. Mark chapter 10, verse 22. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved, for he had what? He had great possessions. In other words, he was rich. He was rich. All right. Let's bring this home. Let's bring it home. He was rich, right? That's why we call him the rich young ruler. He was rich. Could you say that he was also increased with goods? So was he rich and increased with goods? And, and what did he say about himself? All these I have kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? What, what need do I have? He felt his need anyway. The Holy Spirit, was he felt that he needed something. He, need, he knew he was not quite right. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been driven to Jesus. But at the same time, he felt that his obedience, he believed that his obedience was perfect. And he asked, what lack I yet? So he was rich and increased with goods. And he said to Christ and to himself, he believed himself, what lack I yet? I've been doing all these things. What lack I yet? What need do I have? Yes. Could have very, could have very well been. Yes, that he wanted a confirmation that he was doing the right thing, that he had eternal life. But there was something in him that knew that he just wasn't. Something was just not quite right although he couldn't put his finger on it. And Christ did. Christ did. So the rich young ruler, he was rich and increased with goods, and he had need of nothing. He was in a state of self-deception. Does that remind you of anything else in the Bible? So the rich young ruler is the Laodicea. Could it be possible that this story is recorded in the gospel, the gospels in the Bible, for the Laodicean church? I, I think so. I think so. You know why I think so? Because Jesus told him something. If you would enter into life. Now, we're here at the very end of time, and we want to enter into life. We want to be ready when Jesus comes back. And we are given a commission to... Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. If you would enter into life, keep the commandments. It's very relevant to us. Is it possible that it's written for the Laodicean church who thinks that they are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing yet is in a self-deceived condition? Could it possibly be, like the rich young ruler, we believe 
that we're keeping all the commandments of God, but we're really lacking something. We're doing all the right things, but something we know in our hearts, something is not quite right. That we feel that we're lacking something amongst us. Could it be that Jesus is trying to reveal to us today? Could it be that he's knocking on the door? Because he was knocking on the door of that rich young ruler's heart. Could it be that he's knocking on our hearts today? And the very thing that he was trying to reveal to him, he's trying to reveal to us today. You see, he didn't realize his true condition. And it wasn't revealed till Christ put him to the test. Did you know that there's a test coming for us? For the very last people, you know Laodicea? What does Laodicea mean? Judged. People judged, right? Judged. A people judged. They're going through the judgments. There is a test coming upon this world. Christ put the rich young ruler to a test, and that revealed that all of his commandment keeping, all of his obedience was not based on the principle of love. Now, there's a test that is coming to the Laodicean church. Will that test also reveal who believes in their heart that they're doing the right things, they're keeping the commandments, will it reveal that they're not doing it from the principle of love? The test is coming. Are we, are we ready? Do we have that principle of love? Is, does everything that we do spring from a heart of love towards God and men? Yes. And yet the Laodicean church has the opportunity to come into the closest relationship with God that anyone else has ever had in history. Yes. And see God without seeing death. Yeah. So there's a special opportunity for God's people at the very end of time to truly come the closest because humanity has fallen after 6,000 years, has fallen the furthest away from God. And those are who he takes and brings the closest. The six is not the one. You know that. The six, the doing good was not the thing that he lacked. Is it important to do good? Yes, Jesus says you will not enter into life without keeping the command, without doing good. So the doing good is important, but you can't do good with while you're lacking that vital principle. This is the point. The six is not the one. And you know what he did? He walked away Sad. He walked away sad. He walked away from Jesus. He said, Jesus asked him, will you give up everything for me? And he said, no. Can you imagine? Think about what it means to say no to Christ. The ruler says, no, I can't give you everything. The six exposed the thing that he lacked, which is the principle of love in the heart. And it's the principle that's needed in order to make a great sacrifice. Who made the greatest sacrifice in the world? The Father in giving his Son. Now, someone could say Christ in giving up all of heaven. But the Father in giving his Son made the greatest sacrifice sacrifice. And if we learn anything from this this lesson, in order to make a great sacrifice, there needs to be great love. He professed to have great love for God and for men, but when God, or God through Christ, called him to make a great sacrifice, it revealed that he did not 
have great love. Great love can make a great sacrifice. And Jesus says to this rich young ruler and to us, I have sacrificed. I went. I sold. I gave up all of heaven to come to this dark world. I have taken up the cross. Follow me. Follow me. A great sacrifice takes great love. And I pray that each one of us here that want to do the right thing, that are trying to do the right thing, that believe in keeping the commandments, that believe in obedience, I hope that we don't lose sight of the principle from which all goodness springs. And that principle can only come when we are connected to the source of goodness, which is the Father, the goodness of God. And his love is what we need in our hearts. What do you say? Let us pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, Father, I truly believe that this story is on record for our benefit. For those of us who are here in the Laodicean church, Father, if we're honest, we, we have probably all fallen into that trap where we look to ourselves and attribute goodness. But may we learn the lesson that you were trying to teach that rich young ruler that all goodness comes from, your, comes from you. And so we're, we're asking for that very vital principle of love to be implanted on our heart. And from there, all good action and all good word, all good behavior, all good thoughts, every good thing will spring forth from that one principle of love. And so we're asking that you give that to us, that we can truly fulfill the commandments and reveal to the world your character by the way that we love each other. We pray that we can have that true love here today, right now. We're asking in the name of your dear son, Jesus. Amen.